Hey, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Texas Apartment Association's Education Foundation Series, Hints from HR. I am Blaise Spidaleri with Gemstar Construction, and joining me today is our wonderful Vice President of the TAAEF, Becca Ramadi. Say hello, Becca. Hi, everyone. And we have the Director at Brookfield Properties joining us, as always, the one and only Nicole Block. Hello, hello. Our special guest today, she's a, she's a relative to this series, I guess, to some degree. Uh, some might say she's Becca's sister, uh, but she is also an HR professional outside of multifamily, and we're excited to get an outsider perspective. So please meet Rachel Kleban. Hello. Hello, hello. So, she's like an outsider insider, right? Because she's Outsider insider. Yeah, she's related she's with Rachel, I like Rachel it. Becca. Riding on shout the out to Carol. Carol. Carol's watching us uh, live. It's hi, mom. Your mother, if they had a mom, you know. We'll give her a big shout out. That's Oregon's own. But she's in Chicago today watching us from the Windy City. So thank you for, uh, for yeah. tuning in. Jet Set and Carol, nice to meet you. So, Rachel, you have a rich history in human resources. Can you give us a, a, just a brief background of your experience? Sure, I'd be happy to. Well, Becca just reminded me of um, how I very first got into HR, which was back in high school. And somebody said, well, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I said, eh, I don't really want my own job. I want to tell someone else how to do their job and opened up the course catalog and lo and behold, human resources popped out at me. And so I was sort of a believer from the beginning. Um, I've been in the field for a little bit over 20 years and spent the first half of my career in um, the retail sector, working with both sort of stores and headquarters employees. And then in about 2012, I moved into the tech industry. I'm located in the Bay Area. That's what's happening around here. Um, and started with a fairly small Airbnb, um, about 200 employees at the time, and um, stayed for about six and a half years, about 4,000 employees by the time I left. So really had the opportunity to watch that scale and grow um, and focus much of my time there on sort of designing and implementing company-wide HR programs, including performance reviews and performance management, among other things. Um, after that, I went to a smaller company to lead the function, um, a company called Visco, which was, at its peak was about 150 people um, during my time there and um, really had the opportunity to <clears throat> just implement a lot of new things there and, and try things out, which was really fun. And um, the learnings from that experience gave me a lot of confidence to go out on my own. So um, last year I started my own consulting company and have been working with mostly smaller tech companies, um, implementing things like um, career levels, performance reviews, compensation programs, um, and it's been a blast. Excellent. Now, where are you based out of currently? I am in Oakland, California. Beautiful. Well, I'm glad you're joining us today. Uh, I want to talk about the current job market right now, because we know that in multifamily, we're feeling a lot of the difficulties of the job market. Um, I kind of want to know in Oakland or in the tech field in general, uh, are you guys feeling the same thing? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, it's been super hard to recruit so much of that. In fact, that recruiters have eclipsed engineers, which is traditionally are very hard to fill job out here um, or in the tech field um, as the hardest job to fill. And so we're seeing really high levels of turnover, skyrocketing salaries. Um, and I think potentially more unique to tech, um, this push and pull over coming back to the office and employers increasingly wanting to recruit people that are local and can come to the office and candidates demanding more flexibility. So just like a lot of turmoil out here, I'd say. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's really relatable to what we deal with. I mean, you know, I, it's, it's interesting that the job market is not, sometimes we think, you know, we're the only one or, or we're alone in this. And so to find that you're having a lot of turnover and seeing, you know, some of your most um, traditional, easy to fill positions being some of your hardest, I think that those are some of the ones, some of the struggles that we have too, especially in, our, in the maintenance field um, and entry level positions as far as leasing professionals. So it is interesting to, you know, to hear that it's kind of overarching in HR, not just the multifamily sector or the supplier sector. Nicole, I got a quick question for you too. I want to tie something in that you actually brought to the table on the hints from HR in the past, and it's been a reoccurring topic on some of our episodes, but about the great resignation. And mm -hmm. I didn't really touch on the, on the intro of this, but our, we're going to discuss performance reviews a lot on this, on this series today. So do you think that the great resignation would have not have been as great if we were doing a better job with performance reviews? 
Well, and anyone that's listened to any of this podcast in the past knows we're really passionate about growth and development and the why, you know, to attract the job seeker and or to keep the person that's here um, engaged. And so we, we also talked about the great resignation. People were, you know, kind of re-evaluating their lives. They're re-evaluating their job. Are they really happy? Um, what, are they in the right role on the right path? And I think the ones that did not feel connected to the culture, did not feel connected to the company, um, and didn't feel connected to leadership and being part of that vision, um, I think those, I think there's a higher level of resignation, if you will, with the great resignation. Um, so I think that if some of the things, you know, in, in doing the, the debrief with Rachel, I know she'll discuss is some of the things that she wants to implement or has been implementing, is very scalable. You know, if you, if you listen to her introduction, she worked at the end of Airbnb, it was 4,000 employees, and then Visco is 150. So we'll kind of talk through some of the strategies with her, but everything has to be scalable. And I think that if you are evaluating performance timely and you know very um, you know being objective and and being able to set those expectations, then that person knows you're invested in their growth and development. So I I do feel like it would have been lessened, or maybe some of the companies that already have that on lock might have seen less turnover. Um, you know, but that, that I definitely think that, that played a role. It's a great point, and I think maybe it seems like a bit of an over uh, oversimplification, but <clears throat> you know, we saw people quitting for many reasons, but some of the most prevalent were low pay, no opportunities for advancement, and not feeling valued at work. All things right. that we've touched on in other episodes, but you know, as Rachel goes through talking about performance reviews. Um, I think we'll see how these could have played a role. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's jump into performance reviews then. And Nicole, I do want you to follow up uh, to Rachel's response to this question with a multifamily sure. twist. Sure. But uh, Rachel, uh, what's important to know about performance reviews across all industries and why should everybody care about them and benefit from them? Yeah, I mean, I think Becca was teasing me a little bit that you know performance reviews are my passion, but I think that I think performance reviews have gotten a little bit of a bad rap for a couple of reasons. I think in the last maybe 30 or 40 years, there have been some kind of unsavory management practices around um, you know, forced distributions, fire the bottom 10%, you know, sort of cutthroat tactics that have given performance reviews sort of a, a fearful bend mm -hmm. um, and a bad name. And I think on the flip side, this tremendous focus on growth and development, which is awesome. I think that some companies have sort of maybe made performance reviews work too hard to be the thing that's meeting the needs of both assessing performance and addressing performance and development and, and, and so they've gotten a little bit watered down. Um, and so they're less effective. So they're either like scary or ineffective and neither of those are a great solution. So in yeah. my opinion, performance reviews should be focused on doing what they say they're gonna do, which is to review performance. We expect you to do this. This is how you did, kind of here's the Delta, you know, plus or minus. Um, development follows this, right? If you're performing fully in your role, the conversation is how to get to the next level. If there are opportunities to get up to full performance, that's the focus. But I think by sort of separating those out and really focusing on this simple question of how did I perform is a way to make, kind of bring reviews back into a golden age of effectiveness um, and be really impactful um, for companies. And I think that starts with setting clear expectations about what does good performance look like. Yeah, no, and, and I, I would echo those comments. I think that you know, looking, you know, and working for several different companies, you know, over the years, I've seen almost like an overcorrection. Like, I think you're right. I think, Rachel, they were like that 10%, you know, you, you, you everyone fell into a bucket and what are you going to do with those 10%? Um, and so it definitely became almost like a intimidation. So you went into your review and it was like, people weren't receptive because they were terrified of what was yeah. going to happen. But I also feel like it goes a step back even further that probably those supervisors weren't having touch points with those people throughout the year. So they might not have any idea how they're doing, right? It's just one moment in time um, that they're, you know, judged on for the rest of the year. So then I see other companies that kind of overcorrect. Like we want to make sure that this is, you know, um, a good learning opportunity for you. And somewhere in the middle, it might've been that way. But now I'm seeing so much generality um, it just, or just so many open-ended questions that don't have an exact measurement. They don't have an expectation. And so what happens is, is you have kind of the person's bias works into that. You know, the, the, the person who's delivering the news um, and, and, or it's so generic. How do you rate that person? 
Um, and it's, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't make sense. How can I repeat the performance if we, I don't know exactly how I did it? Or how do I stop what I'm doing if I, if you can't give me an example of how? So I think a lot of um, HR departments, I'm, I'm hoping, are kind of reevaluating how they are managing performance through these performance appraisals because they're just inconsistent. And so I think that it needs to be you know, very consistent. I know, you, you know, we talked a lot about kind of setting expectations and kind of talking through what makes up a good performance appraisal. So I know you'll, you'll go into that, but um, I found that overcorrection of multifamily to be something that we definitely need to focus on as an industry. Rachel, a uh, qu question for you. Do you see with your experience too that more of these reviews are being done just annually? Are they doing more quarterly reviews now? Has that, has that shifted at all? I'm seeing twice a year be the most common cadence, which I think mm -hmm. is about right, um, depending on, you know, how big you are. This is a pretty big drain on an organization to do it well. And so I think finding the right both time frames to do it. I think one mistake is like companies will like smack it right in the middle of their busiest season, you mm -hmm. know, whatever that is for you. And it's like, OK, well, like, let's not do that. Um, so finding the right cadence. And I think twice a year is appropriate. Excellent. Well, you mentioned when you were at Airbnb, you started designing some of these uh, performance reviews, what these systems all look like. What was that experience like? It was um, it was fun. It was hard. Um, you know, Airbnb was like in hyper growth, right? Sort of, I won't ever experience that in, in my career again, doubling every year. Um, and so it felt like a startup because we were so close to that experience of it being small, but actually it was huge. So kind of everyone wanted to say, but it was too big to be practical. So navigating all that was really um, challenging. But what was the most fun about building performance at Airbnb was um, linking it back to our mission. So the mission of Airbnb is to create a world where anyone can belong anywhere. So we were faced with saying, how can we make sure that everything we do is led with this idea of belonging and diversity and inclusion? And so that's where I started to learn a lot about how to build these processes in a way that's very inclusive and um and mitigates bias and i think we'll talk more about that but that was sort of the most formative part of it for me is is all that learning that we did so is, a, is it fair to say a lot of that is like trial and error then to see what works what doesn't work and then um, actually oh go ahead oh i was gonna say then following that that thought process where do you think companies go right and where do you think they go wrong in implementing these performance reviews and how they're handling them? yeah yeah so to answer your first question, I would say some was trial and error, but some was research. There's actually a lot of academic research on how human behavior impacts these types of processes. So we partnered with um, an organization out of Stanford that was doing a lot of research on this. And so we tried to actually really balance the art and science of it. Mm -hmm. um, to answer your question of where I think companies go wrong, I think we already talked a little bit about sort of muddling performance and development feedback can sometimes be misguided. Um, I also think that companies miss um, in like being clear on the expectations before they roll out a review process. Yes. So if performance reviews assess performance and you don't know what good performance looks like, it's not gonna, it's not gonna be clear and it's not gonna feel fair, right? Yeah. Um, in my world, in the tech industry, the way I see people solve this could be through like a goal setting process, you know, here's what I'm gonna deliver, did you do it? Um, a lot of companies I work with, um, I work with them on defining what are the expectations of each career level? What does it mean to be a level one versus a level two versus a manager versus a director and getting really clear on that and building performance reviews on top of that? My favorite way of doing it. Um, or even just simple ways of saying like, what is expected of the job? What is the deliverable? And like, what are our values and how do we assess that? So that to me is a big mistake. I think we put the cart before the horse sometimes. We're like, we need performance reviews. But then we never answer the question of what is good performance. No, absolutely. And I, I know we talked about this a little bit yesterday, but it, you know, it is interesting to me that it does feel backwards because one of the challenges we all have industry wide, and it sounds like, you know, really with, with Rachel too, is she mentioned turnover. So there, there hasn't been a time whenever I've either taken over like support of a new region or support of a new you know company or area or whatever, or there hasn't been some inconsistency in looking at because you know, the goals are already built in, they're already baked in by the time I come to review them with the person that's sitting in front of me. And the inconsistency um, has been, I would say, probably more prevalent than not. And so that tells me the expectations weren't set from leadership 
you know, to middle management, to site level, all of those things, there wasn't a continuity between the objectives. And so I kind of feel myself starting over and that's really not fair to the associate because we have to identify, you know, two or three items that we're going to really leverage on over the next year. And here's how they get there. And then a couple that are growth and development, you know, based as well. But I think that it, it definitely muddies the water because when you have come to a new company or you transfer to a new property, if you're multifamily, it happens all the time. And you pull up the review, the mid-year review of the person that you're now doing end of year review on, and it's just inconsistent or it's not what you know you, you're working towards. So I think that's definitely a challenge. And then also I think what we don't do as well um, is we always, we also talked about like interviewing, coaching, counseling, those types of things are all done behind closed doors. So I don't think we train our managers well enough to prepare a consistent objective appraisal and deliver one. And I think that that is definitely a miss. I know I can speak for, for our industry as far as looking at leadership over the years, because it's something that's done behind closed doors. I don't see it modeled. You don't, you don't come in and say, hey, Becca, I'm going to do Rachel's review. Come on here, sit right next to me. Especially since they're sisters, they'd love to tell their mom about that. But <laughs> I'm just saying, you don't, you don't do that. You know, so, so you right. have to still coach that. And I think that we don't give it enough time. I've seen some mid-years um that like 30 minutes on the calendar i'm like your team member is only worth 30 minutes to you it breaks my heart you know i mean can put some time on the calendar to sit down because half the conversation is reviewing the other half is tweaking and goal setting and strategizing you know how do you do that in 30 minutes so i think that those are the questions we also have to continue to ask ourselves as as leaders in our industry on the supplier side Absolutely. operator side doesn't matter is make the right time for our associates and train them on how to conduct and facilitate performance appraisals Nicole, well, I think you... using, using career path, that piece of it that Rachel was talking about is really important for our industry because we talk about it as a career path. You're not just getting a job, it's a career. Yes. And so using performance reviews to help facilitate that, to push um, advancement forward would be such a great tool and benefit of you know spending that time it takes to implement a performance review that, that focuses on that. I would just share one very proud anecdote that um, when I implemented a review system like this, it was based on the leveling framework at Fisco. I did a retro afterwards, right? You know, asked around, how did it go? And an employee said to me, she said, oh, it was great. I know exactly what I need to do to do my job today. And I know exactly what I need to do to get promoted. And it was like, maybe the best Perfect. moment of my professional HR career, because it's just, it's, 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 that's what you want for people is clarity, right? And so I think, um, you know, both the system and the delivery and the support from the manager working together can offer that. Now, I do want to circle back to a little bit of the delivery and the language portion mm -hmm. of that, uh, because I do, I, in some of my experience as well, I think a lot of things get lost in translation when you're going off a written performance and then you're delivering it in a verbal mm -hmm. sense. And there's a lot of different ways to communicate, whether that's verbal or nonverbal. And I've been in a situation before where I had to do a performance reviews to employees that weren't even my direct employees because the manager might have been out or there might have been right. some situations. And I'm going based on if a written word and I'm not sure what the intent is behind that. But to circle back through this, how can managers be trained? Do they need training? How do they get training to be able to you know, correctly deliver uh, the objective uh, from the performance yeah. review? Yeah. Should I go first? Sure. Um, so absolutely, well, well. they need. Yeah, I think they need training. Um, so I have to say, don't recommend leaning exclusively on manager training to make things good, right? I mm -hmm. always think managers have such a big job. What can we do for them? And that's why I think the structure of these reviews and processes, how can we look at that and sort of take every um every margin of error out of it and leave them to do the job that they can do uniquely well, which is to deliver the feedback. And that's where I think the manager training um, can be really impactful. So um, I would say teaching managers to make the feedback, what I would call like as receivable as possible. And I think there's two things and we've, we've chatted about this before, but um, I think one is to focus on the behavior and not the person. Absolutely. And the other is to describe the impact of why that either good or bad, why that behavior was meaningful. So it's like, hey, um, you delivered a really um, thoughtful report. 
And the impact was that everyone was really clear on what needed to be done next. Um, or the report that you delivered, not you, but the report that you delivered was really impactful. It had a lot of detail that, um, that was useful to the team. As a result, people knew what they needed to do next. Like that's really meaningful feedback rather than like great report uh, or you're good at reports or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I think those two simple things is, is where I usually focus my training. Yeah, and I, I totally echo the sentiment as far as the behavior. It, it tends to take the sting out of it. You know, we, we already talked about the fact that people, some people are going in, depending on past experience and performance appraisals, already locked down and ready to not be, just be like, like, like their guard is up. Yeah. So if you can go in and use language that is, you know, that is directly like poignant towards them, then I think we lose them. I think we lose them right in the very beginning. Whereas if you make it about the expectation and the behavior, the expectation was a 10, you came in at a nine. Here are the, you know, here are the behaviors that contributed to that. I think that makes it more also more like possible to change. Uh, you know, we, we talked about like if, if you're at a nine, you want need to be at a 10 and you're at the mid-year point, what can we do to get to that one more level and agreeing on that and having a plan and strategizing and being part of the solution? I think that managers um, need to be part of the solution with their team so that they can be, you know, coaching and developing in between those, you know, mid-year and, and, and end of year appraisals. So I definitely would echo the sentiments with the behaviors. Um, but I, I do feel like the the managers you know need to have goals that are completely you know they're not anecdotal they're not there's no way you know, it's, it's a it's a metric it's it's a smart goal it's you know it's very specific so to Rachel's point like they can just go through figure out what the you know the score is for lack of a better term and then deliver an objective appraisal and then set goals accordingly and I think that when there's mud or it's unclear then you know blaze you said it best it, you know, they're not going to hear what I'm trying to say, you know, because the, it'll be kind of just muddy in the middle. So I think there, that we need to be specific. Is there any prep work for the employees, Rachel, as they're coming in to talk about these reviews um, that you would recommend? Absolutely. I actually, one thing I was going to add was I like to teach managers how to make it a conversation and not just a one way, you know, yeah. um, and where to ask good questions and, hey, does this surprise you or what do you think? And so I think, um, you know, some companies have employees write a self review and reflect on that. I think yeah. if they don't, it's important to still take the time to sit down and say, like, what was I really proud of this year? What do I want to work on? And, and what do I think my areas of improvement um, what is my next step that I'm interested in? So I do think, Becca, absolutely coming in prepared for that conversation. Expect your manager to ask you those questions, even if they don't be ready to answer them. And, um, and I think, you know, a great practice, which I think is becoming more popular as I see is like actually just sharing the review ahead of the meeting mm -hmm. with the employee and yep. letting them take it in and kind of knowing how they process information. Is this someone who needs two days to process it? Or is this someone who shouldn't have more than an hour to process it? Cause they might spin around, you know, like customizing that experience for them, but giving them some time to think about how they want to show up. Mm -hmm. So I feel like Nicole, Rachel, you both kind of touched uh, a couple of points on rethinking uh, the review process a bit. So how do you think, and maybe Nicole, you want to start with this, how do you think companies should start rethinking their review process and what's a, maybe a first step that they can take or just getting into that right direction? Sure. So I, I think that, you know, take, you know, again, not trying to run before we even started crawling, you know, have they identified what KPIs are important to their company and their performance? Have they identified what their culture looks like? Do they have a mission statement, a value statement, anything that they, you know, that, that can you really identify the company and its culture and its, its, its business plan, for lack of a better term. So if you have identified all of that, then I would ensure that you're backing into topics and objectives that are going to serve the, the, the company's mission statement. They're going to serve the vision. You know, like, you, like Rachel said with, with Airbnb, like how are we ensuring that, that, that they feel at home anywhere as well? Um, so I think that that probably, I would start there. Uh, and then I would look at the the timeline, I think you're spot on, Rachel. I don't know why we always do end of year appraisals in December um, or do the mid years in July whenever everyone's running around the, the craziest leasing season in, in AC oh, season yeah. ever, right? So I look at the timing of it. And then I would also look at how you back into it. I think that you know we need to give leaders time at the top, for lack of a better term, to define the objectives for the company so they can disseminate that through all levels of leadership and we're all on the same page before we write that perform the performance appraisal. I think sometimes we're kind of backwards in doing that, and then you get inconsistent objectives. 
Um, and then I also think I love the, um, I think that more companies need to look at the approach of levels and performance levels. I, I love that you that you um, support that, Rachel. I've worked with companies that do that for service technicians. Um, and I think it's been wonderful as far as the skill set between a tech one technician, a tech two technician, and a tech three who's about to be a service manager. They're, they're next to be promoted. And I think by having certain you know, things they have to you know, achieve as far as a skill set, um, that's another thing we can use for their growth and development. So I think that those are some things I think companies could, should, would, please do uh, if they want to ensure that they are going to be um, growing leaders and then keeping, you know, keeping everybody engaged. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, I like plus a hundred to all of those points, Nicole. Absolutely. Um, and so what I think I could add that would be unique, unique is to say, I would love for companies to really think about um, how bias comes into these processes sure. and how to mitigate that. And so it's okay. That's like my main soapbox of my um, career. I'd love to just share a little bit about where I think companies could look at their own processes and where what we know about some of these biases. Um, so, you know, bias is a human natural thinking process, right? It just helps us make faster decisions. We all have them. Um, but when we look at how it comes into the review cycle, there are like particular things that come up that we can look for. So there are certain biases that you can really train towards um, things like a similar to me bias. I tend to rate someone who's like me or has a similar background more favorably or a recency bias. Something happened last week and it covers like covers the whole review period. Um, but we've also learned from research, for example, that open text, open box review commentary yeah. um, tends to lead to more bias. Women get more feedback about their style and men get more feedback about their hard results. When you yeah. think about who gets promoted, it's who got called out for the best results, right? And so that has a lasting impact. Um, and then the other one that I think is really interesting is that um, we know that managers anchor on self-rating. So if you have a review system that has a self-rating, um, it is very likely that the manager's ratings are going to reflect those ratings um, because it's easier, frankly, right? It's not conscious, but they go, oh, yeah, I guess that person is a exceeding expectations. Um, the problem is, is that women in underrepresented groups tend to be less self-promotional and so therefore rate themselves lower. And so either removing those or making them blind so managers don't see them before they um, select their own rating is really impactful. Um, so, you know, taking out some of those open text boxes, putting in more of those criteria-based or expectation-based questions, yeah. um, addressing self-rating and training managers. You know, if you do any kind of calibrating where you get managers in a room and say, oh, I rated this person that, I rated this person that, educate on those on those um, biases in that conversation so that people can kind of go, oh, well, that sounds like recency bias. What about three months ago? Um, those are some things that I've done that have really felt like it's raised awareness. That's Rachel, wonderful. I have a question for you that I need to get before we run out of time because we oh, sorry about the job seeker. And okay. should a job seeker ask about performance reviews right up front? How do you feel about that? Is it a bit presumptuous? What's your what's your take? I don't think it's presumptuous. The only caution I would give is that um, sometimes review cycles are linked with pay cycles. And so just being clear about the intention of the question. Hey, I really want to make sure I know that I can be successful in this job. What does your performance review process look like? Because if you just say, oh, well, what's your, when's your performance review? The, the, mm, it could be read into as like you're asking about when I could get a raise. But Nicole, I'd be curious what you think on that. No, I, I agree. I think, again, understanding the process and how it works, I think it's and then let them know the why. Like, I really am trying to be focused on this career path, as, as Becca said. Um, I think, yeah, I think that, that probably makes more sense. Not like, so when am I getting reviewed again? Okay, that, I think yeah. that does sometimes have a different connotation. But, but is it fair to ask too, like, all right, uh, if as a new hire, do I get an employee review? What is it after 90 days? Is yeah. it, you know, six months? That's about the process. Do, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Like, well, do you, Becca, do you have anything else that you want to touch on before we get no, to some housekeeping items? I'm a proud big sister. Uh, clearly, <laughs> uh, you know your stuff, Rachel, and I'm so thrilled that you could come on here. Also, Thank speaking, you for having me. Yeah, speaking as the daughters of a psychologist, I have to say HR, like most of the apartment business, is very... Um, 
you're very much a counselor, a psychologist, you figure out lots of stuff and it yes. really shows in your knowledge of all this. So great job. Um, Dad would be proud. He would be proud. Well, thank you everybody for a wonderful conversation. Everybody, you can join Nicole and I at TAA One Conference April 28th at 9 a.m. in person Come for a live Come meet us in person. We're going to be doing this live. Yeah, so come on out. It's going to be a ton of fun. And you can register for the TAA One Conference by April 19th if you haven't done so already. TAA.org. You can go to the TAAEF.ourraffle.org for your chance to win a Mercedes. What kind of car is it exactly? I just know. It's a Mercedes CLA 250 white with um, a gorgeous like tan interior and it is a gorgeous car that you want i know win. i bought my tickets already they're 25 dollars each or five for a hundred uh you could also go to the taa ef booth at the trade show and they'll have a kendra scott boutique up so you can do a little shopping while you're, you're rolling around so uh becca nicole you guys have been amazing as usual rachel thank you for taking the time and being here to share your expertise and your knowledge. I'm Blaise Spitaleri, and we'll see you at TAA conference. Thanks, Rachel. See you at TAA, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody.